Hey friends, it's May. Welcome back to the channel. And today I will share with you what happened with Keith last year. And hopefully you learn something. It's a really interesting medical case. And also, I guess, an insight into how when a vet has their own pet that's ill, they also go through the same phases of emotions. So let's go. First, I adopted Keith last year, I think around March. And Keith was an FIV positive stray. So he's a feline immunodeficiency virus positive cat. And that's really common in stray tomcats because they get into fights. And one of the main transmission ways of getting FIV is through cat bites, mixing of blood, saliva, and bodily fluids. So Keith was found covered in cat bite abscesses. He was really in a poor and bad way. And they cleaned him up and cured him in the hospital. And I wasn't there. So how I found out about Keith was through one of the Facebook Posts that my colleague had shared and essentially Keith was transferred to a rescue called Pepper's Pet Rescue and I was looking around for an indoor only cat so FIV positive cats need to be kept indoors to prevent the spread of the disease to the wider population so anyway I decided to take the plunge and adopt Keith here are some videos of the process So I visited the rescue and Sophie was really kind to show me all her animals and also Keith and he was so lovely. He was still a bit shy um, but he settled in really really well. Day by day he settled in and he was quite a calm and sleepy cat and I remember working every day for six days straight and didn't really pay attention too much to how much he was eating. I did notice he started eating a little bit less, um, but I just put it down to being a bit picky. So I went to get some more gastrointestinal food, special food, some probiotics, and I also gave him a meropotent to see if that can help him bounce back. If it was just like a tummy upset, that's why he wasn't eating that well. It worked for 24 hours, but after that he became inappetent again, and I was really worried because he wouldn't poo, basically. So I brought him into work and the morning that I took him in, my colleague and I checked him over. So I popped him in his kennel and then I started to do my morning consults. I checked on him again after that and he was yellow, like jaundice yellow. He had yellow mucous membranes and ears and I was like, whoa, this is a sudden progression. So I panicked and then we went to the hospital to do some investigations. At this point, I was just panicking and I just wanted to make sure that he was fine. So we did some blood tests and they came back really bad. So he had moderate anemia, hyperglobulinemia, hyperglobulinemia. So increased globulins, increased proteins, which can be a indicator of inflammation. He had low creatinine and low urea, which is fits the picture of him not eating well, so losing muscle mass. And when we checked him over again, he did lose quite a lot of muscle mass on his spine, but somehow it didn't click in my head. I didn't notice it. Um, and I just felt really guilty for not noticing it. I did wonder if he was just getting fat, but actually he was getting bloated with lots of fluids in his belly that we didn't know about until we scanned him. So I was in a shock and I felt really guilty and sad and started crying. So my colleagues took over and they did all the investigations, kept me in the loop. And I was in tears about to go back next door to consult. But they were like, no, 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 we've canceled your appointments to um, give you, you know, some time and space to take care of Keith. So I was like, Okay, thank you. So I stayed at the hospital and helped with the investigations. And for the first time, I felt helpless. Like we had the blood tests, but they didn't give us like a specific diagnosis because of how general his condition was. In cats, if you have lethargy, hyperexia, weight loss, those are the signs that can typically lead to a hundred different Okay, maybe not 100 different differentials, but quite a lot of different differentials. 
So plus his FIV existing condition, and he was a young cat. His differentials were ranging from like potentially IMHA because of the anemia, uh, lymphoma, pancreatitis, liver disease, FIP, um, other infectious diseases. So we had to rule them out step by step, and we had to send some tests off. It was a little frustrating because they had the postal strikes on as well. So I was worried that the results wouldn't get there in time, and we were just worried that his blood levels would continue to drop. In particular, the specific tests we sent off were the Glasgow FIP wet profile because we were suspicious of his bloated presentation, clinical signs, and also his fluid that we checked was quite like a modified transudate type of fluid that made us suspicious of it. So very proteinaceous fluid, basically. We sent off a Coombs test, a blood film examination, feline coronavirus PCR, and also toxo profiles. Quite a lot of tests and waited for the results to come back. At this point, we were quite tricky about FIP. And if you followed my Instagram, you know that he had FIP feline infectious peritonitis, which is different from his FIV disease. It is a difficult disease to diagnose, basically. The tricky thing about FIP is that there's no like definitive tests for it. FIP is a mutation of the feline coronavirus. And if you're a cat that was rescued from the stray population, even healthy cats, they can have a bout of coronavirus disease before, which is mostly gastrointestinal so like diarrhea signs and they can recover from that well and it doesn't necessarily mutate into FIP so you can see that it's quite difficult because if you test positive for coronavirus PCR it doesn't mean that you have FIP when I was in uni I believe the only one of the only ways to have a definitive test is a gut biopsy so taking pieces from the gut and looking under the microscope to check for the histology but that's quite an invasive test if you think about it which requires you know anesthetic sedation and we didn't feel Keith was stable enough so we had to combine all the other tests including the Glasgow FIP profile along with his clinical signs to make the decision we started him on sporty fluids, medications, anti-nauseous agents and placed a feeding tube because he hadn't been eating well and I went home and I remember feeling really sad because it was an empty home. Keith wasn't there, the litter tray was empty, there's no sound of his paws, pitter pattering at home. And luckily my colleague took me in and she basically made sure that I had food and we had dinner before I went home. So it was quite a traumatic experience and I was very grateful for all my colleagues basically. The next day, his PCV dropped further. Initially, it was 25% when we did the first blood test, and then it dropped to 10% overnight, which I was very, very afraid of because we would need to do a blood transfusion then. And at that point, I was so worried because I wasn't sure whether to continue with the investigations and treatment, given that he also has FIV. Will he do well on treatment? Is he very stressed? And I was worried about putting him through all of that. And I couldn't make any clinical decisions because I was so emotionally involved. So I called my university friends. I talked to my colleagues and basically said, you know, I think you guys need to make the best decision or I really need to lean on you guys for help. And luckily we, well, luckily, I suppose we had a recent FIP case that also required blood transfusion. So basically we still had the blood typing kits. We had some leftover medications and it was pretty much a no-brainer to start the transfusion and also the medications. We obviously needed to contact um, cat donors, which very kindly, Steph, thank you, Steph, for bringing her cat Ludo in to save Keith's life, essentially. And I got to assist with the blood transfusions and learn a little bit as well for myself. Although I wouldn't recommend taking it as a learning process on your own pet. I hope your pet doesn't go through what I, my pet has to go through. Um, but anyway, we move. After the blood transfusion, his PCV was back up, which was amazing. And we started the remdesivir medications. So a brief segue of the remdesivir drug is that it used to be a black market drug. And there were Facebook groups online that would help source the drug. So remdesivir was first created by Jaleed Sciences to treat 
other viral conditions. And I believe the research was being done into respiratory, syncytial virus, for example, Ebola virus as well. And you couldn't get it legally. So what owners would do was there was like a Facebook group for FIP cat owners called FIP Warriors or something like that. I'll link all the research and the articles below, which is quite interesting to read. And you would get these black market drugs that costed a few thousand, some thousand amount of dollars that would ship from China or other countries. And owners would then administer these drugs at home to their cats or ask vets to help inject their cats, which makes it a very difficult situation for vets because if it's a black market drug, you can't legally give it to a pet owner's pet um, i suppose you could teach the pet owner how to use injections and stuff but you know there's a tricky situation there anyway fast forward to august 2021 it was finally legalized to be used in cats in the uk which is amazing and i believe that the covid 19 pandemic somehow sped up the approval process as it was given emergency authorization use um, by the FDA to use in certain countries. So I think that sort of helped it. I guess one of the positive things to come from the pandemic, I suppose. So back to the story. Um, we started him on seven days of the injections. First few days was IV when he had an intravenous catheter. And then I took him home. So we gave them via subcutaneous injections, so under the skin. And this was very, very painful and it, if you read the protocol guidelines, there's loads of things that we can try, such as gabapentin to help them be more calm and less painful. Um, lidocaine creams to put on the skin before we inject. However, I tried all of those things and Keith would still hate the injection. And I dread to think how pet owners used to do this with the black market drug before, before like it was legalized because as a vet myself, it just breaks my heart that I have to inject him and hear him cry. And it's just a large volume of medication as well because of his body weight. So that was not fun. However, after two, three days of the medications, he started to gain his appetite and he made his first poo. I have never been so excited to see poo in the cat litter tray. <laughs> so that was amazing to see. And after the injections, we continued him on the oral tablet, which thankfully for these pill assist things, Keith just ate them like a treat. It was a dream. It was a long course of medications as well, 84 days in total. So if you can imagine, the costs add up. And without pet insurance, thank you, Agria, which is my pet insurance provider, I would not have been able to afford it at all. And also staff discounts as being a vet and helping out on all the procedures, that really, really helped as well. So I'm really, really grateful. I'll link all the guidelines of the FIP treatment as well because it's fairly new and there is still like research ongoing to see how effective the medication is. So far, there's anecdotal evidence of it being 80% successful and in 20% of cases, there may be a relapse. The important thing to check while you're on the medication is your pet's weight because FIP tends to happen in younger cats and younger cats will then, you know, put on weight as they grow. So you must make sure you get the right dose of medications, which led me to buying my own cat scales for Keith because I'm a crazy cat mom. And also measuring, well, just having a feel of their belly to make sure they don't have fluid again. So I kept feeling his belly every, every, um, every so often and also follow up blood tests. And as you can imagine, like all these further outflow testing can be quite costly if you don't have these facilities yourself and checking them at home. So things like measuring the waist to see if they are, you know, their belly is becoming bloated or not, things like that can be one of the methods as well that's been discussed as well. Fast forward to January. When he finished his course of medications, he had his blood tests and they were all clear. So I was super relieved because the blood test before, his globulins were still high, which is a known thing. 
Um, however, he was clinically fine, so we just kept going with the medications, and finally he's clear. So I'm really, really, really pleased and thankful. And he became a completely different cat. He's more active and more crazy now, which I suppose is great because that means the disease is gone and he's eating well, he's very bright, and I'm just really lucky that my FIV and FIP cat is now healthy. So if you want more information on FIV, I've made a video specifically to talk about it as well, because uh, more people should be aware it is a viral disease that is not necessarily a death sentence. And also the other main takeaways from this video is make sure you get your pet insurance because you may never know when you need it, but when you do, it really, really helps. Anywho, I struggled a lot trying to make this video perfect, but I just realized that done is better than perfect. So I hope you enjoy this video and gain some value from it. As always, leave any comments below on what you think of it. And I hope to see you in the next video. Thank you for spending this time with me.